Let's talk now about the Baffy pelagic zone, and this zone ranges from depths of a thousand meters to about four thousand meters. Here it's very cold and very dark and extreme pressure. Remember, for every ten meters we gain an atmosphere of pressure, so ten times a thousand meters is going to be a hundred atmospheres of pressure. Imagine a hundred atmospheres on top of you. You'd be like the witches in Salem, all right? It's a lot of pressure, crushing pressure. Nonetheless, organisms survive down here. The pathopelagic zone is largely uncoupled from surface processes, though we still have to remember that a rain of particles from the surface do still pass through this zone, and so those particles are going to be important. But the organisms that live down here have kind of a life of their own that's not necessarily dependent on the seasonal cycles of the um, epipelagic and mesopelagic zone. Carnivory and bioluminescence, very common in this zone. And one thing we know for sure about this zone, we don't know very much about it. That's what we know mostly. We just know very little about the bathopelagic zone. But as we continue to explore, and as maybe some of you uh, take careers in oceanography, this could be a zone for you to study. Here's a bioluminescent jellyfish found in the uh, bathypelagic zone. This is one that displays what's called the burglar alarm defense. And the burglar alarm defense, as you learned in chapter 12, is one of those defenses where an organism creates a sticky mucus of bioluminescence, and that sticky web of mucus, bioluminescent mucus, gets stuck onto its predator, which then lights up that fish and attracts its predators, just like a burglar alarm alerts the police. The bioluminescent burglar alarm alerts the predators of an organism's predator. It's really mean down there. Here's a picture, a little video image of a bioluminescent jellyfish. This comes from NOAA's Ocean Explorer site. and I would encourage you to check out this site and learn more about the fascinating organisms and their bizarre behaviors and bizarre adaptations that we find in the bathypelagic zone. Here's another one. Why it makes these kinds of colorful, round, circular lights, we can only guess. Now we come to the abyssopelagic and hadopelagic zones. These extend from 4,000 meters to the seafloor. Of course, a hadopelagic zone is only found where we have oceanic trenches. Here we have extreme pressure, as if the pressure wasn't enough already. Very scarce food, no light, um, very cold temperatures, really extreme conditions. Yet life exists down here. Now, it may not exist in the kinds of amounts that you would find in the surface waters, but there's quite a bit of life that we find down at the bottom of the ocean, surprisingly. And how it does it, how it makes its living, we can only speculate. These organisms have to be very efficient at how they obtain food. They also have to be very um, slow metabolically so that they can hang out and survive for long periods of time without eating. And then they have to be opportunistic. When food does make itself available, they have to be ready to go to get that food energy that they need when they need it. So it's a really different set of strategies for organisms living in an environment where food's not readily available at these extremely cold temperatures, no light, and crushing pressures. You thought you had it tough. It's really fair to say that we really know very little about these zones. Now let's talk about the bottom zones. Now, of course, the benthic zones are going to have similar characteristics, except we're now talking about changes in the seafloor that are an additional feature. So a little bit more geology, of course, uh, with the benthic zones than we have with the pelagic zones, the vertical life zones. So um, again, with the benthic habitats, we go from the region between the tides, where you may have done some labs or spent some time just looking at different kinds of intertidal organisms, the subtidal, the continental shelf, deep coral gardens, abyssal plains, seamounts, ridges, 
seeps, trenches, and many other benthic habitats that we might find on, this, on the seafloor in addition to the zones themselves. So these are the kinds of seafloor features that we talked about in chapter four that now come into play and we put also on top of those geologic features all the different physical and chemical and really even biological characteristics for the water that's now on top of these. And seamounts, I don't know if I mentioned that one, but I'll mention that again, are an important area of research recently because they tend to attract lots of different interesting organisms.